Hey, this is Kirk Barrett, and welcome to the Best Practices Show, where we take a look at the best business practices from the best dental practices across the country. And I have a major treat for you, one of my favorite teachers of all time, Dr. Sam Lau. So you're going to want to sit back and enjoy this. So do me a favor, grab a pen and hit the share button, and we'll see you in just a second. Hey guys, welcome back to the Best Practices Show, where we're so excited to have you on today, where we truly, this has been so much fun for me the last uh, week or so, just getting to uh, interview some of my closest friends in dentistry, my best teachers, and today is no exception. Before we get started, though, here's what I want to let you know. We are shooting this live on Facebook, so as you see the feed on the side or below you, if you have questions, please ask them, and I'm going to ask the master himself as we're interviewing him today, and I'll see if I can't get your questions questions answered. Now, quick program note too. Some of the things we're going to be talking about with Dr. Lau today are on numbers and things like that. And I still, I'm getting a ton of questions on this. Now on Thursday, we'll be doing a live webinar. So you'll see a link to that. So if you want some great information, some actual step-by-step -step stuff on some of the things that we're going to be talking about today, click on that and it'll be a fabulous day. I'll be able to answer all your questions and we can go more in the details. But today we're going to go through some of the big picture and thought process uh, changing stuff. And uh, I am so grateful to have you on, Sam. So, Sam, thanks for being on. Well, you're welcome. Thanks for having me, Kirk. Yeah. You and I, you and I have had a, uh, a good relationship for a few years since I believe you saw me at Panky a few years ago. You still talk about it. Yeah. Can I, I'm going to do the intro on that too, because here's what happened. So I, uh, I met Sam about 20, it was about 21, 22 years ago. I went to the Panky right. Institute, sat in there and Erwin Becker and Clayton Davis were my two instructors. And then they brought in a third instructor and it was you. And it was that day. I was actually 24 years old. And I remember there are so many things that you said that day that absolutely changed the way I thought about Perio, about the thought process. At the time, you were running the faculty practice at the university. It was University of Florida. And, I mean, you had 43 ops. Um, it was incredible how your thought process worked in that whole thing. And I want to dive into that, some of that today. So, um, Sam, if, if somebody has been living under a rock and they don't know who you are, can you tell them who you are and where you're at? And you're out doing a lot of speaking now and a lot of consulting. Sure. Uh, I'm still practicing at the University of Florida and uh, primarily with laser now. And I do some speaking. I do consulting uh, with uh, BioLace and Philips Sonicare and some other groups. Uh, and also I'm going into some dental practices, general dental practices, and doing some perio consulting, specifically perio, on how to ramp the practice up to uh, appreciate perio and uh, get some positive return, including uh, revenue from perio. Yeah, absolutely. Imperio is the cornerstone for great restorative dentistry. So, um, so many things I want to talk to you about, like there's huge, um, but one of the things that resonates so strongly between you and I is the core values thing. And you talked about this, just the absolute core values of who you are as a practitioner. And I want you to just comment because you and I talked about before we started how important that is as a young dentist or as a mature dentist, how important is core values in what you do? Well, uh, the last time I checked, uh, the head is still connected to the body. The head is an incredibly sensitive uh, area of the human body. <clears throat> and for the most part, uh, we're not dealing with a typodont. We're dealing with a person. And I, I do believe sometimes that is a lost art, Kirk. In fact, I'm, as I'm thinking about it right this moment, uh, if you think about dental education, which, which is very good, uh, but, you know, we really start out with what? Models. Typodonts. Maybe that's the problem. Maybe the first impression is Ivorine instead of being someone. Mm -hmm. And as I've mentioned to you before, one of the core areas that we always do is ask a patient, why are you here? Mm -hmm. And really mean it. You know, you and I have discussed about listening, the art of listening. 
you know, when you're doing through couples counseling, what do they do? They, they, they ask you to ask your spouse a question. Your spouse has to repeat the question before they repeat the answer. Uh, that's the, that's the art of listening. So, you know, you, it's, you, you, I'm not saying that you want to listen because you're supposed to listen. I think you should be listening because you want to listen. Right. Because without that, you really can't get into their head. Forget about this thing about trying to typecast patients and develop treatment plans based on, you know, what kind of nature they are. I think it's just a thing of studying human nature. And, right. and that is what is really going to get us out of. Well, let me mention something to you. There are those who believe that dentistry is going towards commodity. Mm -hmm. You hear that commoditization of dentistry. You know what that is? That's actually the first and second year of dental school. It's possibly the third and fourth year of dental school. You know what that is? That's a buckle pit. That's a crown prep. That's a scaling and root planing. That's not oral health care. Those right. are procedures. So uh, it is not meant to, to, to judge because we have outstanding dental practitioners. Uh, you mentioned Clayton Davis. In fact, I was just with Clayton Davis. By the way, I'm still at Panky every eight weeks. I go down to keep a scheme, which is not a bad place to be. Yeah. And, uh, you know, we still try to, we're disciples. We're, we're part of the Panky disciple team that's right. attempting to try to move dentistry into oral health care and make, actually make it, as you've just suggested, into a relationship, right. not about a cusp. Yeah. Absolutely. Absolutely. And you mentioned this too, you know, when we talked about it, it's not about the gums, you know, um, it's, it's really moving from the gums to the head. What does that mean? Like that's a very powerful concept, um, in all of great restorative or comprehensive dentistry or even perio. Well, first of all, let's talk about restorative dentistry. Mm -hmm. Restorative dentistry is an extremely powerful component of oral health care. It will always be a powerful component of oral health care. The gingiva, the bone, the periodontium actually assists in doing what? Making dentistry look great. Yeah. Making dentistry look great. Uh, you know, I always talk about how to manipulate gingiva mm -hmm. so that our body will enjoy restorative dentistry. Now, I don't want anyone on this on this podcast to take this the wrong way. But, you know, anytime you put a person made thing in the body, the body sees it as a foreign body. They do. So our whole job is to attempt to make patients create an environment to where they enjoy and the body accepts restorative dentistry. Mm -hmm. And you may be aware that implants are a wonderful, wonderful service for patients, but they're not a panacea in 2017. Right. Uh, that uh, they they are also a foreign body kind of component. So what reacts to that that foreign body? I guess you could say the gums, but really it's the mouth. It's the whole body reacting to it. And that's where at some point you and I will have a great conversation where we're going to talk, discuss that periodontal disease is not an infection, my friends. It's an inflammatory process. Mm -hmm. Get over it. Yeah. As long as you keep trying to to cheat those gums, stopping that bleeding stuff, you are truly just touching the tip of the iceberg. So when I say it's not just about gums, don't focus on, well, he's got bleeding gums, she's got bleeding gums, this one. No, 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 no. It's much, much, much more than that. Yeah. It's, it is really looking at the whole body, not just and again, I'm not going on some tangent where we say floss or die. You know, I always say, right. what, you want bumper stickers to say floss or die? Yeah. No, 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 no. But we are discussing the fact that we really are specialists of medicine. Right. Now, I'm right. glad we're not in medicine. Believe me. Yeah. But aren't we really oral physicians? Absolutely. See, we're, we're taking too much for granted here. Mm -hmm. We're still working on dentitions when we should be working on dentitions and what's connected to those dentitions. It's yeah. a concept. It's a passion. It's embracing. Um, and I do believe that is what is going to drive patients back into oral health care who have left us. Yeah, absolutely. There are so many things, again, that I want to ask you. And a lot of this is mindset, just changing the way you think about things. Like one of the things that you taught me that changed the way I thought is you never use the word treat when it comes to periodontal disease. You always use the word manage. Can you describe that? Like that's a that's a very important change in thinking. 
Sure. In fact, what I suggest in practices, you know, when I growing up, we used to have the cuss jar. So in other words, in East Texas, anytime we said a bad word, you had to put back in there, it was a nickel. Right. Well, I suggest in a practice, you have the treat jar. And every time anybody says the word treat, they put a dollar in there. And mm -hmm. I'll tell you my passion about that. Treat is when a surgeon takes out your gallbladder. Mm -hmm. There's no managing after that. Now, the gastroenterologist might come back and do something, but there, the, treat means commodity. Treat means I fixed you and I'll never see you again, please. I think the last time I checked, there was recurrent decay. The last time I checked, there was Chagrin's. You know, there was xerostomia. Uh, you never, never, never treat gum disease. Actually, we have data now showing gingivitis is no longer reversible, that it sets up a whole inflammatory cascade with this antigen antibody response. So my friends, all of those, you out there, they're dealing with those orthodontic patients that have got gums dripping over those bands because those teens aren't doing anything. Then you take all those appliances off, you think everything is fine. What if it's not? What if you created a whole memory system by which if it sees any biofilm again, it's going to overreact? Right. We don't have all the answers. But one thing I do know, a patient is yours for life. Yep. Manage, manage, manage. And Kirk, I know that you say, I know that you are doing this also with, with uh, practice management stuff, but you know, it starts at the top with the dentist, but let's face it, unless every single team member is saying the same thing, it ain't going to happen. Yeah. That person answering your phone, she needs to know the concept of manage. She needs to believe it. She needs to drip it. Right. Those dental assistants, when you're not in the operatory, they need to be doing the exact same thing. They have to appreciate these concepts. And guess what? When they came into your office, when you interviewed them, they didn't know them. Yeah. These concepts are not taught in hygiene school, dental assisting school. Uh, these are these are these are street concepts. Yeah. Know and your patient. Absolutely. And that is so huge. A lot of this comes back to the vision of the dentist, making sure that this is a thread that's very strong with your core values all the way through. A lot of hygienists, and I'm sure you could speak about this firsthand, they don't do this because they're afraid or they don't have the skills or the verbal skills or the know-how or they've even had a conversation with the dentist about what our vision is for patients. Now, you have a vision, a lifelong vision to bring perio into the world of general dentistry. Tell us what that means. Like, what does that mean? Well, the last time I checked, if you really want to talk about a growth niche, mm -hmm. uh, I think there's like 47.2% of all Americans over the age of 35 have bone loss by the CDC. Wow. Not by a bunch of periodons trying to get people in the office, by the CDC. If you look at patients that are 60 or older, 70% of them, two out of three of everyone who walks in your office, should be getting managed periodontal care. Mm -hmm. That is huge. I'm not taking anything away from sleep apnea, from worn dentitions, none of that. But my goodness, sitting right under your nose right. is something called perio. And if you and I were to do a best case practice or do a business plan, let's say mm -hmm. you and I were doing a business plan for an office. Right. And we were looking at, okay, we're going to do a SWOT analysis here. We're going to look at strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Okay, let's think about this. Okay, let's go over to the opportunities. Okay, let me think about this. Well, everybody who walks in your office should be getting about uh, a couple thousand dollars worth of perio on just a scaling and root planning, which we don't call that anymore. That's for another, another time, another place. Um, but think about, and you know what we're doing, Kirk? What? And you have to be a little controversial. Please. Some of us are doing profies, profies, profies. Mm -hmm. But, Kirk, we're not doing profies. There's no hygienist on this podcast doing a profie on a patient that has calculus. I know their code of ethics. No, what we have got are practices doing periodontal procedures on periodontal patients and charging profi fees. Mm, that's and powerful. And there is a reason for that. Please take us through that. Okay. Let's do some soul searching. I love it. Go. Okay. The first thing is we don't like patients 
who turn us down. Mm-hmm. And it's as much psychological as financial. We dentists, we, we, we're not salespeople, although yeah. we're in a selling business, right? Every time, Kirk, you present, you know, do a case presentation, you're selling. Yep. It, it, may, it may not be a Chevrolet, but you're selling. Mm-hmm. So what we're doing is we don't like rejection. Mm-hmm. And so what does a patient want? What's a, you know, I will tell you, when a patient calls up as a new patient, do you know what the conversation is? I want a cleaning. Yeah. I want a cleaning. It's like taking my car to the car wash. I want a cleaning. Mm-hmm. You know, I'm going to Costco. I want a cleaning. I'm going to CVS. I want a cleaning. Guess what? The way things are going in dentistry, you may walk into Costco one day, get your eyeglasses repaired, get your uh, prescription filled, get your flu shot, get a cleaning. Mm-hmm. I hate the word cleaning. Yeah. Cleaning is something they do in your office at night. <laughs> The, you know, I, I will tell, and this is not to sound discriminatory, but I'll say, you know, what are you, a cleaning lady? Mm-hmm. So from the prophylaxis standpoint, what we're doing is we're trying to cram a four-hour scaling and root planning into a 50-minute prophylaxis appointment when really they should be getting a totally, you know, scaling and root planning. Sorry, I'm on a, I'm on a tangent here. Scaling. What does that mean? You got scales on your roots? Mm-hmm. Uh, Jane, I'm going to do a scaling today. Well, let's think about this. Scaling. Root planing. What's that sound like? I'm on my way to, to Home Depot and I stop at Black & Decker. Yeah. Uh, you know, you're, you're, you're rooting up. But no, no, Kirk, I'll tell you what we call it. We call it a deep. Deep cleaning. Okay. What were you doing before that, though? Yeah. That's- but Jane, today, <clears throat> today we're going to do a deep cleaning. But right. Jane says, oh, I can't wait. I thought you were going shallow. You're going <laughs> deep. Oh, let me pay you some more money for that. So so please, you know what we're doing? We're setting ourselves up for what? Failure. Yeah. The yeah. whole thing we do from the beginning is failure. Who's the most important person in your practice? Person answers that phone. Yeah. Boy, she or he has got to be hell on wheels. Yeah. They, they're the ones because if you we don't do that, all of our patients... There are only two things they ever say, right? I want a cleaning, and will my insurance pay for that? Yeah. Those are the two primary things in today's dentistry. Yeah, and a lot of this goes back, and you've seen this a thousand times, Sam. A dentist starts a practice, buys a practice, gets a practice growing, and then they throw a team member up front, and they just say, go, without any conversation about the core values, what we're doing, what I'm doing back here with each one of the patients. So it goes back to the whole vision for patients. And that whole structure. Now, I want to go back to this because this is so good. The reason these conversations fall apart is, number one, you said they don't like rejection. Give us, walk us through this. Like if if I'm a young dentist and I'm watching this and I'm like, that totally happens in my office. What do I do? Give me some like thought processes, Sam. What would you tell me as a young dentist? Where do I start? Well, the first thing thing you're going to start is uh, essentially uh, creating a script. Mm-hmm. A script that you write, a script that no one else has written. If you want to find some others that scripts that are written like from you or whatever, that's fine, Kirk. But at least adapt them to you, who you are, what you are, why you're there. You know, I think every single morning a young dentist should get up in the morning and say, why am I here? Yep. What am I doing? Where is this going? Right. I would suggest to you that some of us get up in the morning and we go to work and there's a head in front of us as if it was an assembly line. We work on it. We go to the next head and we work on it. We go to the next head. And guess what? There are patients who actually want to be on an assembly line. Mm. You know, I appreciate that we have all kinds of dental practices out there, don't you? Because every patient has a place now. But I do know one thing. And Erwin Becker would say this, and Dr. Pankey would say this, and Jim Pride would say this, Gordon Christensen would say this. You know what they would say? Now is an incredible time in dentistry. You know why? Because now practices are different. Right. You can just, now there is a certain level of where before there was an amorphous kind of an amenity to practices. Now there's a differentiation. Mm -hmm. I would tell a young dentist, do you want to differentiate? Yeah. Is it time for you to differentiate? Tell me what you want to be, and I will tell you where you may want to go. 
Right. I cannot take you where you do not want to go. I love some of our millennial dentists right now who are what I call old souls. Yeah. They, 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 they've got the positive part of the millennial, but they also are core value people. They really care. You know, I, I guess when I say that, it seems so in a way trite. They really care. Mm-hmm. But, you know, uh, I, I have dabbled in, in Eastern spirituality in the past. And there's some there's something called eras in and eras out. Have you ever heard this concept? No. Tell me. Every person that you meet, Kirk, I, and all of you listening, I, here's what I want you to do today. When, when you when, when you meet someone, whether it's somebody you know or for the first time, Many times you can classify them as arrows in and arrows out. An arrows out person is someone who's thinking about you. An arrows wow. in person is someone who's thinking about themselves. Wow. And interesting enough, generational, unfortunately, there's a sandwich. Your baby boomers have always been arrows out. Why? Because that's the way we were taught. Our parents were in the depression. And at some point, I would also like to discuss with you um, moving dentistry into considering a baby booming practice. And what does that mean? Uh, the sandwich, by the way, are the Xers. Kirk, you're, you're probably an yep. Xer. Yep. An Xer is confused. They, they really want some of, the, some of the values of the baby boomer, but, but you were given things that I wasn't. Mm-hmm. You were you were, whether it be a VCR or a, you know it doesn't matter. You were giving things I didn't have. Yeah. But so then you developed into something called I want it now. And also, by the way, and not to take anything away, and this is generalities, but we came into a very capitalistic society more so more so than baby boomers. Uh, Xers, we always say when you see a Bentley being driven by a baby boomer in Miami, she owns it. When you see a Xer driving a Mercedes AMG, they lease it, yeah. and so it's different. It's not. It's not a judgment. It's, but millennials are the sandwich. They actually have some of the values of baby boomers, um, and and so from that, that young practitioner, you know, I don't think they all want to be employees, Kirk. Mm-hmm. I think that is. I think that's us talking. Right. I don't think they all want to be employees. I think there are some, not all, but there are some who really do care. Mm-hmm. But whether it be student loans, whether it be thrown into situations uh, that were somewhat unavoidable, uh, they they are in an employee kind of scenario. But that's fine because there are patients who want to see what? Employee dentists. Yeah. And yeah. guess what, Kirk? There are some who want to see you. Yeah. What you have to do more than ever is market. Yep. Now, I want, I want you to expand on that, too, because, Sam, I absolutely agree. I love the arrows out concept, and I had not heard that before, and I totally see it. And that's the opportunity because there is so much competition. You and I talked this about this before. We don't, you and I don't subscribe to the whole doom and gloom. There's an incredible opportunity, but what's happened is we have let the profession by default fall into the whole need thing. So I want you to expand on the whole marketing and the want thing because you're a genius at this. So take us into that concept. Well, I, I, I only have one asset and it was given to me by my mother and that is, that is basically common sense. Mm-hmm. And so th- this want, this need thing of doom and gloom kind of thing, I, I absolutely believe that, that we are on the cusp of, of changing this and thing into this oral health, whole oral health concept. Uh, but as I mentioned to you, there's always three mission statements to a practice, right? Yes. Remember, you and I had that conversation. Love it. Uh, the first mission is uh, provide the highest quality of care to my patient. The, th- the second mission is uh, be happy doing it. Right. Uh, some generations will love that one. And the third one is we've got to make money. So, mm-hmm. Kirk, every time I go into a practice, I bet you do the same thing. Uh, we we both aspire to Dr. Panky saying, uh, do what you do best, the money will come. We, we yep. always, but at the same time, let's not put our head in the sand. 
you know, I know practitioners who do phenomenal, phenomenal work. I know practitioners who also give a lot of dentistry away. But you know, at the end of the month, they're passive aggressive. And they rant and they run all through the all through the office and they beat up on all the team and they say, oh, how come we didn't have a good month this month? What, what's going on? I worked harder than I've ever worked. Well, I think, you know, and this is what you do, Kirk, is that you tell them work smarter, not harder. Mm -hmm. uh, if you're going to work, my goodness, at least get something in return for it. So, you know, me. Uh, you, you mentioned that you'd heard me say, uh, always get the money before they get to the garage. Yeah. A and I believe that because accounts receivable is your passive aggression. Yeah. No, it's your passive aggression. Uh, you, you know, it's, there are two words, isn't there, that no matter what business you're in, those two words are being said somewhere in some corporate room today. Value proposition. Yeah. Wow. They roll off the tongue so easily. Value proposition. Well, if you just created value proposition, son, everything would be okay. Well, guess what? They don't walk into your office with value proposition. Mm -hmm. Remember Dr. Pankey saying above the line and below the line? Yeah. Below the line patients are what? Most of the people who walk in, this, in, in, in through that door. What are above the line? What we create. Listen, Kirk, if you and I, if every patient that walked in was what we call Mrs. Got Rocks. I mean, she said, you know something, uh, doctor, uh, everything you've said sounds fantastic. Uh, I'm just going to write out a check for mm -hmm. everything. In fact, I just want to write it out for the next five years of stuff you can do for me. You and I wouldn't be on this podcast. <laughs> yeah. Really? No. I mean, we are here to try to assist our colleagues in making it a better place. Yep. Um, and so that, that need and want, I absolutely believe that you must market. So let me give you a thought. How many times a day do you get an email where someone says, I can grow your practice with new patients? How Ten many times a day? Times a day? Mm hmm and you know, uh, we we were uh, we were gone for two or three days. I was at, at uh, I was doing some calibration laser training in, in Southern California. We came in, and and last night we went to get the mail. Uh, we're over at the beach uh, today, and um, went to get the mail. There were three postcards from local dentists in that mail. Okay, you know what it was? Free whitening with your new patient exam. Thirty-nine ninety-five from a periodontist saying CBCT examination radiographs. Thirty-nine ninety-five. Mm. Um, you know, I, I, I the next one I'll probably see is a Goodyear blimp dropping leaflets with free right. nitrous with your next cleaning, especially in a college town. Yeah, um, that's not to me marketing. How many times does a dentist go in and see every single recare? patient. By the way, we don't call them recall. Recall sounds like, you know, you're recalling your Samsung 7 mm -hmm. notebook phone. Yep. Recare, recare. I'm going back to this whole concept of manage. So you and I could sit in the hygiene operatory of most dentists complaining about new patients and you and I could grow a practice, couldn't we? Well, we could. And Sam, I think you'd agree with this. You know, in our work with practices all over the country, 99% of them just don't need a single, one more single new patient. There's just a, there's a practice within the practice. Sometimes there's two practices within the practice or Correct. three practice. Diagnosis is incredibly low. And a lot of it is just this. They just don't slow down. down. You know, you watch and you're like, well, why didn't you diagnose? Well, I was too busy. busy. And then you look at the numbers in a hygiene practice, and you're really good at this, but you look at the mix of services in any hygiene practice, very rarely do you ever see it at 30%. And I think, you know, as so many great clinicians have said, is say it has to be at least 30% because there's not a shortage of periodontal disease. As you mentioned, 47.2%. You know, there's a lot of this stuff happening, but the problem is this, we don't, you know, we we don't create enough value for patients. We're afraid to go there. So when there's an opportunity, 
you know, it's so hard to try to market to new patients. There's a world of dentistry right there in front of you. Where would you start in a hygiene operatory if your numbers are so low? And I'd love for you to talk about the numbers. What's 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 the truth of a great restorative practice and the perio distribution in hygiene? Well, it uh, that 30 to 40 percent is a good number to start. Mm-hmm. You know what the average for a profi to perio is in the United States and the practices I go into? What? 10. 10? Wow. 10 percent. Why? Uh, again, fear of rejection, the team not appreciating it, totally not embracing it. You know, when I, I you know, when I go into a practice of general dentistry, you you know who who my obstacle is? Who? It is not the dentist because he or she is the one that got me there. Mm-hmm. It, it's not the hygienist. It's not even the office manager. It's the culture. It's the culture. How many times have you heard? I got to tell you something, Doctor Lau. We start charging scaling and root planning in this practice. You think we got it bad now? Nobody's going to show up. That's culture. Yep. That's not Jane. That's not Susie. That's culture. And having the faith. So really, it is not just, you know, I, I it, when you do a strategic plan for a practice, you know what we always focus on? Like everything. You go into a committee meeting. Well, let's do this. Let's do that. Let's do this. Whoa, wait a minute now. First of all, where do you want to go? Then I'll tell you how to get there. But you haven't told me where you want to go yet. Are you sure you want to do this? So time somehow I go into a practice, they thought they knew they wanted to do this. By the time we finish this, I don't know about that. Maybe doing a, a, those 90% profies, that wasn't such a bad idea. I mean, you know, I'm kidding in a way, but, but the bottom line is the first thing you need to do is do your metrics. Yeah, absolutely. Once and you do the metrics, yeah. Once you do the metrics. Well, you know, and the first thing I do when I'm doing the, and I'm sure you do it, is that uh, we, we say, go, go to your, go to your dentrix opt in, whatever. I'm going to give you a form. It's going to take you about 20 minutes. Jane, who's up at the, uh, who's your office manager, is going to fill it out. And here we go. And then we just have, uh, we, we, I believe in metrics. You know, you know, there'll, there'll be times when I'm with a practice and I will say, okay, the first thing I, one of the first thing I need to know is what percent of your practice is third party? Mm. Okay. And then from that, you need to tell me what percent of your practice is PPO, what percent of your practice is copay, what percent of your practice is HMO, do you take any Medicaid? Well, you got to know that before right. you start, because if you're getting a $43 reimbursement on a prophylaxis from a third party company, and I'm going to move you to where you're seeing your hygienist is seeing one patient an hour, that ain't going to work. Mm-hmm. Right, Kirk? Right. That's not going to work. Right. No matter how much, how much relationship building you want to do, if you're getting forty three dollars an hour, it ain't going to work. That's the money part. Yeah. So the so the bottom line with with all of these things is determining what kind of practice you want, and then we can move into it. But the things that you one has to do is first of all embrace the culture, and move it out of that ten percent, and at least get it up to that thirty to forty percent. You know, anytime I ask a dentist when they're with the whole team, the first time when we meet together, we only meet for one day, but in the morning we're all together. And so when we're there, what I ask them is, I say, now, what percent of your practice is third party? Mm-hmm. The dentist says, well, probably, I don't know, about uh, 30%. I will tell you, the office manager, who probably was there before he was, says, you got to be kidding me, doc. We're at 90% third party. And he'll say, are you serious? Yeah. Isn't that amazing in a small business? Isn't that amazing? It then I'll amazing. say, what is your, what I'll say, what is your no show cancellation rate? You'll say, well, I don't think that we are, I, it does seem to me like we have some openings in hygiene. I mean, and the office, the hygienists, by the way, the hygienists will never say, well, we have too many openings. <laughs> what I, I know I'm, I'm kidding, but you know, yeah. I mean, what hygienists would would ever debate over cancellation no show rates unless they were on commission? Um, but the but the the uh, the office manager will say, "You got to be kidding me! We're, we're like seventy five percent show rate," and he'll say, "You mean twenty five percent of the time nobody's showing up?" they have been in practice thirty years. <laughs> yeah, so, I mean, I, I'm not laughing, you know, because we we are you know the mission of you and I having this conversation is to help. Right. And so I, I'm not trying to make fun of anyone or, or, or judge of anyone, 
But we really do have some very positive things that can truly make your life so much better. Yeah, absolutely. And again, a lot of it goes back to the philosophy of the clinician and the overall how it goes through the culture. And also, too, there's huge benefits to this. Sam, you could probably talk about this. When you see the percentage of perio or um, 4,000 codes go up in any hygiene app, there's a direct correlation in the quality of the restorative dentistry and the amount of restorative dentistry that just happens naturally. And Bob Barkley God rest his soul. You know, he passed away before I turned 10, but reading his stuff, he was tremendous in a thought leading process that he believed the more that you did, the more people actually wanted on the comprehensive things. And that's one of the the numbers that we see is that anytime that goes up where you see this stuff start to happen, the culture comes alive. Naturally, the byproduct is things get done in a much better way, more complete way up front. And I'm sure you see that all the time. Absolutely. I, I I would never suggest that you build a practice on perio or you build a practice on, uh, you know, going back to even occlusion. Right. You build a practice on comprehensive care. Yep. And when you build a practice on comprehensive care, I would absolutely agree with you. You're not doing things that should not be done. But, you know, you can't do things if they don't show back up. Right. I th- we've totally forgotten this. Uh, you know, someone mentioned this to me the, the other day, and I was thinking about this. If you've been in practice 30 years and you have a recare practice, you're a general dentist, okay? Mm-hmm. If you started out with one hygienist, Kirk, after 30 years, if you had any type of sustainability and now you have one hygienist, mm-hmm. what would that say? Yeah. That would say, say that you're that would say that you're treating and that you're not managing. Right. Right. Because the the bottom line is, and I think what both of us are trying to stress today, is that that recare patient, that's the patient. Mm-hmm. Because now I wanted to go, I, I wanted to connect some dots on this new patient concept. Isn't it true that your primary resource of new patients is from your existing patients? Right? right. Isn't that what you isn't that what you say? Right. It's, it's your existing patients. And again, remember uh, Dr. Pankey, you always said a lot about him this morning, but Dr. Pankey always said, like, likes, like. Right. People seeking commodity in dentistry, their friends are the same types of personalities who are seeking commodity in dentistry. Folks that are seeking comprehensive care and really want to be with you and trust you and know that you're that you're that you are literally caring about them. Guess who they refer friends and family who are the same way. Right. I always throw something out and I would like to even get your take on this. How many new patients do you need a month in a general practice in the United States working four days a week? And it's not rhetorical. Yeah, it's not rhetorical. I would say this. What I have found is that if you're a restorative dentist per dentist, you probably need one qualified new adult patient. And I mean qualified, somebody who has the same shared value that would truly want what it is that you have to offer. Because the truth of a great restorative practice, and we've talked about this last week, Some people think, oh, great restorative practices are doing full mouth cases. They're not. Most restorative dentists, I find, just don't really want to manage more than seven or eight big cases at a time. That's it. And then you've got a lot of aerobic dentistry, a lot of things that just have to be done in between. So, you know, you've got the the, so you've got a good composition. But I would say the answer to your question is about one qualified new patient per month or per day. I'm sorry, per day. Absolutely. That's exactly what I say. I say 15 to 20. Right. 15 right. to 20. Now, if a dentist tells me, sometimes a dentist will raise their hand when I'm speaking to a large group. He says, well, I, I'm, I'm getting 50 new patients a month. Mm-hmm. Well, I am not going to judge anyone, but I don't know how a dentist working four days a week could buy it, him or herself could manage 50 new patients a month. Yeah. In fact, I wouldn't want to even gloat that. Yeah. Uh, 15 to 20 new patients a month is a substantial amount if they are under the categories that you've just suggested. Right. Um, you know, and, and we're not commoditizing dentistry. Uh, but, 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 but if that is the case, 
you know, in a community, think about that, okay? You said 20, okay? And I would agree with that. That mm-hmm. only means, Kirk, 240 people a year in your entire community. Right. You, look, we'll multiply times that times 30. Well, I got to tell you, that's not a lot of people in your entire dental lifetime right. that you have managed, but mm-hmm. you manage them well and they return to you. And the more they return to you, every single study has ever shown this, the more they return to you, the less dentistry you have to do in the future. Yep. Yep. Yeah. And that's the hardest thing is keep in any business is, you know, the retention aspect of it. Now we are finding a lot of people coming from word of mouth, but word of mouth, you know, can also include now Google reviews, right? you know, which, which gets people to you, which is absolutely true. But the absolutely. truth of what you're talking about is really getting to know your patient, sharing the core values. And one, I just want to piggyback on this because it's not about the gums. Sam, what you've said is so true for a young clinician. Number one, if you can get your core values straight or you know why you practice, and it's not a it's not a democracy when it comes to core values. You should never say, hey, guys, what do you think our core values are? You took the risk to be a dentist. It's your core values. So your business has to scream what you believe. Then throughout the thread of your team, those people have to say, have the same core values. Now, it's not good, bad, or indifferent, but if somebody doesn't have the same core values what you and I have been talking about, it's not going to work. It'll fall apart eventually because right. you found – your favorite people in dentistry, Sam, as well as mine, they, we just share the same values. You know, it's right. not – and then your patients, your favorite patients that you've ever had in your chair – They just care about the same things that you care about. And so what you're talking about is creating a whole level of practice where you just, it's an expression of what you believe. And that's when it truly becomes fun. And, and not everyone, not this, this style of practice is not for everyone. Right. That's fine with me. We're not dictating how you should practice. We're dictating that you should know who you are. And then determine what kind of practice that you want. Right. Uh, I would, I, you know, our, in a dental school, they're, they're, a dental student's best, some of their best mentors are those who have been in practice and bring those values into the dental school. Some of their best mentors are the courtesy faculty who come in. You know, if I, if I could just go off one, on one thing, you know, you and I have been talking about what? Mentors. Right. We've been talking about mentors, haven't we? Yeah. In fact, there's a whole conversation now that we've there's a lost art of mentors, mm-hmm. mentors. I've yep. had five mentors in my life uh, and I've been able now to go back and find each one of them before they passed away wow. and tell them how important they were. My fifth grade school teacher, I actually found him out. He was at my dad's funeral. He was my he in my 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 dad was a coach. He came to the funeral. He was, you know, 70, 75 years old. I took him aside and I said, Mr. Baden, I got to tell you how important you changed my life in the fifth grade. Mm -hmm. Because, first of all, he was a male. He was my first male teacher. Yeah. And, and I, you know, role modeling or what have you. Uh, But I've been able to seek out all five of those. And there may be more. You know, I'm not dead yet. (laughs) You know, there may be more. I'm still learning. I get up again. I get up every morning and. And uh, like you, I'm listening. I'm, I'm trying to understand. I'm trying to figure out. I'm a student of, of humanity to a yeah, certain degree. Absolutely. But and it's it, mentors. It's mentors. Yep. And that's a constant thread of everybody that I've interviewed that I consider an influencer or an industry leader. They all had great mentors. And when I got started in this great industry, people use the word preceptorships, and they don't quite have that anymore. Um, and it's something that we, we desperately need. Now, a couple things I want to ask you. Let's say I'm a young dentist coming out. What are some of your best pieces of advice? Let's say I want to be a great restorative dentist, and I know perio is important, but I can't turn the corner. Sam, what, what should I do? What should, where should I start? What should I do with my team today? Give me, some, give me a little bit of a recipe or some low-hanging fruit that would be easy for me to make some traction this week. Uh, well, the you mean as far as restorative dentistry goes or building well, it into the practice? Just building it into the practice, maybe okay. incorporating better perio, um, better conversations. First thing you got to do is you're a small business, you got to get the team together. Yep. You got to get the team together, you got to get a whiteboard, you got to have somebody writing stuff down, and you got to get the team together so you're all saying the same thing. I am really hung up, and so was Stephen Covey, bless his soul. 
on communication, communication, consistency, saying the same thing, having the same theme. Um, the first thing also, the second thing I would do is every single morning, um, we, you and I talk about this consistently, but you've got to change this habit. A young dentist cannot get there at 8.01 to see an 8 o'clock patient. It doesn't work that way. Right. A young dentist, even if they are working in a DSO environment, and now some positive DSOs are doing this. You have to do grand rounds. Remember, I, I mentioned to you I drew blood when I was in uh, dental school. That's how I yeah. put myself through school. And I will tell you what they do on every shift change. They go through every, and I'm glad they are if you're in the hospital as a patient, they go through every single patient on that floor every, at every single shift change. Wow. I'll tell you what sometimes we do. We walk in, we start, we, 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 where's that hand piece? Here we go. Mm -hmm. And I'm suggesting that if you start at 830, no, you start at eight o'clock every single morning. Right. You go through and that each hygienist brings in those eight patients. Notice I said eight, not 12, mm -hmm. brings those eight patients uh, charts in or uh, paperless practice. And you go through every single patient. All your dental assistants bring in all your patients for that day. Go through every single patient patient while you're having coffee it's a way well, you call it a hug meeting you call it a huddle i don't care what you call it mm -hmm. but to walk in at 801 and start seeing patients and i will see this i mean i'll see that car pull in but you know something also kirk and this you know you and i sort of touched a little bit on some psychology here so i think it's okay yeah but you know if you are a practitioner and you are coming in at 759 for an eight o'clock patient you need to ask yourself are you happy? Mm. Are you content? Because I've been there. I've done things to where I would get there at 8.02. And then I began to realize, why wasn't I getting there at 7.30? I'd lost my passion. Mm. I call it Sunday evening. How do you feel on Sunday evening? You know, growing up in East Texas, my dad was, uh, my my first dad was a bricklayer. Well, it's called the, the, the Eagle Flies on Friday, if you know blues. Mm -hmm. I mean, you work really hard, and then on Friday night, uh, you get paid, you go out and have a good time. Saturday, you wake up, you have a good time. Sunday night, whoa, it's starting all over again. But how do you feel as a dental health professional on Sunday evening? Are you passionate about, I mean, I'm not saying you stay up all night can't because you can't wait, but are you dreading it? Are you passionate? Right. And that's right. what, that's what, and by the way, because I've reinvented myself many mm -hmm. times over. You have too, I'm sure. Yeah. But guess what? That doesn't mean just because you're not passionate now doesn't mean you can't be passionate later. It's okay to get down on your knees and understand that, hey, I don't really want to do this anymore. Or, I, no, I don't really want to do it this way anymore. Mm -hmm. And sometimes, isn't it wonderful about technology? I don't care what it is, Kirk. But sometimes when someone, uh, I'm working with someone on uh, advanced training with laser. You know why they went into laser? Why? Because they needed a little bit of a boost. Yep. It's okay to say it. Mm -hmm. Oh, Sam, now it's fun. It No, Sam, it's fun again. Yeah. And by the way, I'll just say one other little plug here. You show me a CE junkie, and I'll show you an incredible, passionate practitioner. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Right? That's so critical. And it doesn't have to be perfect, but once you lose the spark or the passion, it has a ripple effect across the rest of the people around you. It's probably carrying home. And I get this all the time, too, Sam. People are like, oh, dentistry, it's just not as fun as I thought it would be. And what you said is so perfect. It's how you do it because you, this is the United States of America. You don't have to practice any one way. You can do the exercise you mentioned at the beginning is just figure out who you are, which is a tough journey for younger dentists because sometimes they don't really know themselves. They don't have enough self-awareness. I call it the arrogance of youth. You know, and I had it too. I was like, I don't need to listen to anybody. I've got this all figured out. And then you get a little bit older and you're like, wow, there's a lot that I need to learn, you know? And once you figure this out, you figure out how you want to practice. And I have a lot of people, there were people that I would, you know, see in their early journey and they go, wow, I came back from a course and 
I'm a one patient at a time dentist. And I go, that's great. And they go, well, I have a problem. I've got like nine or 11 ops. And I'm like, well, you don't have to do it that way. The cool part is you could do it how you want to do it. And when you start to make that come alive, Sam, that's where the Sunday night thing doesn't have to be perfect, but you're like, I love what I do. You pull in your parking space and you go, I do it my way. You know? Right. So right. I think that's absolutely huge. You talked about the grand rounds. You talked about getting the team together. What other, what other, um, you know, important things would you say to a dentist who's like, Sam, I want to do this, but what else should I do? Well, you take it one step at a time. You start looking at your numbers and you start looking at what the hygienists do. And you start basically, by the way, ensuring that if you're going to be the captain of the ship, you can't have a hygienist see the patient first. Mm -hmm. Sorry. That's just against my, you, you know, you, we started this conversation out about core values. Yeah. Uh, hygienists don't do cleanings on the first appointment. Now, tell me why. It, tell me why. Well, because if you're doing cleanings on the first appointment, by the way, you don't, you haven't even done the diagnosis to determine what kind of cleaning they're going to get. Right. And if they do a cleaning on the first appointment, and I'll tell you a practical reason, if you're in a third party practice, you do a cleaning on the first appointment and you charge a profi code, you've told every third party company in the world that that is a gingivitis patient. Then you're going to come back and want to put in some 4341, 4342 scaling root planning codes. Then they're going to deny it. You're going to blame it on the third party. Well, as you know, Kirk, there are no diagnostic codes in dentistry. Yeah. So diagnosis comes by a therapeutic code. So if anything, a practical manner is please, uh, if you've got any significant gingivitis, you should be charging uh, a D4355, which is your gross debridement code, or uh, using the new code, the D4346 code. Uh, that's out there, which is gingivitis, uh, scaling the presence of gingivitis. But you put that profi code on there, then you have nailed them as a um, as a gingivitis patient. Uh, by the way, let me let me do recant something. If you do put the forty three forty six code there, you're, that's also the kiss of death. You cannot use a scaling and replaning app for that too. So I don't want any misinformation out there. So the bottom line is, when you put a profi code on a patient. You've told third party in the big computer systems in the sky that that is a gingivitis patient and you'll have to send in your firstborn to be able then to get periocoding. So the bottom line is go back to values. Yeah. Again, seize the patient first. Preliminary. I have, by the way, and I'm sure that you do too, some of, most of us do, there's a whole systematic approach on a new patient in perio who sees them first. What do you say? Where do they go next? What happens? It's very perfunctory. Mm -hmm. um, I'm, a, I'm an Edward Deming guy. Uh, in, you, know, in, you know, when you in mo some of the, our folks on this podcast know the whole concept of social engineering, meaning I believe in zero defects. You know, we still still want to have the warmth and caring of a patient, don't we? But at the same time, there is a certain systematic approach by the way a patient goes through a practice. You know, it's not like the, you know, and I'll give you an example. I, uh, last night we were on the plane and, and when we were John Wayne and the, there was an issue with, uh, uh, you've heard this before, the auxiliary engine can't start the plane. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not that the plane has just got there. The plane has been there for like 12 hours. I think you probably could have figured that out. So you see my mm -hmm. as being a, a, ward, uh, a, a road warrior and all this. So, so then they bring on the crew. Well, the crew is not a Delta crew. It's a John Wayne Airport crew. So then they get into a debate over signing off if it's fixed or not. We sat there for an hour and a half because they could not figure out who really has the approach. Is it Atlanta Delta or whatever? Here's my point, Kirk. Is that the first time a plane has ever taken off from Orange Wayne County Airport? Is that the first time an auxiliary uh, engine has not been able to start the engines? And you know what? Baby boomers, which, by the way, I do want to have a, 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 another conversation with you about that. Baby boomers... They're looking. They, they, they. Yes, they have expectations, mm -hmm. but they're looking to see if you do have some positive practices. But if you, if you, if your practice demonstrates confusion, you know what they think? Then you're confused in their mouth. Right. Maybe it's me. 
But I like to walk into a medical or dental practice in which it does seem like they have their act together. Right. So then don't come back and tell me that you can't figure out a way to get new patients when I walk into your office and it seems like there are what? Mixed messages. Yeah. And again, you know, Covey was incredibly bright, wasn't he? Mm-hmm. What a book. The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Mm-hmm. And, and you did mention the, the, uh, my, other, my other book uh, that I require anyone on the team to read, and that's good to great. Yeah. Wow, what a title. You know, do you need to say more? My no. point is, if you're a young practitioner and you want to build a practice, you're going to have to create some greatness. Yeah. Because good is going to be commodity. Right. That's being, that's being blunt. Yeah. And I will tell you this. Young dentists always tell me, well, I have to do this. I have to do this. I have to go to work here. No, you don't. Mm-hmm. There are plenty of practices that you and I have been talking about that are looking for who? High quality millennial practitioners. Right. Not necessarily just to buy their practice, but to invest in them, move them ahead. So please, if there are young practitioners, um, do not believe that your only route out of this is to do something you don't want to do. Yeah. I disagree with that wholeheartedly and sorry for my passion about it, but I disagree with that. Yeah. And so I think that's, probably, yeah, so we probably turned a few off on that. They said, well, you don't oh, know, my stuff. you know, I owe $500,000. Well, hey. yes, my friend, you had choice. I would say the same thing, though, too, Sam, and I say it to my kids all the time. Don't you dare go to the world and ask the world for anything. You become valuable enough that the right. world will find you. And so all, you know, this goes for everybody in every profession. I think the right. second that you realize, hey, the more valuable I become, the more people will come to find me and the more you'll be compensated. There's no mistake why some of the highest paid quarterbacks or baseball players, they get paid extraordinary amounts of money because they provide extraordinary amounts of value. And even a great dental assistant, I always say, you want the secret to, you know, I tell dental, you want the secret to being extraordinarily paid? They'll go, yeah, what is it? I go, you've got to become the single best assistant this dentist has ever had. Then You'll never be unemployed. People will find you. They will compensate you well. And they'll say to you, I have to have you in my life. And I and I even have the perio conversation. Like I I like this conversation. Peridonis, you know, you and I have joked about this too. Peridonis have to be the hardest working individuals in the world because every time dentistry makes a shift, they have to find a way to make a living. And I tell you every peridonis that I work with, I say, you have to create so much value that people, general dentists and pe- people like say, I've got to have you in my life. You're that valuable to me right. that I couldn't do what I do without you. And I think that's what you're talking about here. You hire leaders. Yeah. You hire leaders. Someone says, well, you know, she's, she's really assertive. Fine. Much rather have that than someone who is sitting there saying, you know, I'm here to suck spit. That's yeah. what I do. You hire leaders because when you are not in that operatory, they are. Yeah. They are. Yep. You know, and, and again, we could have a conversation, you know, when we were talking about this whole concept of recare patients and things of this nature, uh, you know, we believe that 50% of all restorative dentistry, for the most part, is sold, completed in the hygiene operatory. Now, tell me why. Op- tell me about that. Well, first of all, you've got to create a system by which there is time in the operatory for them to be able to do it. Mm-hmm. If you're on a 45 minute block, Kirk, you, yeah, it is tough. I mean, you, you, if you think about what we've done for hygienists, by the way, I have this minute by minute by minute, a 60 minute block on every single minute, what is going on in that, in the, in that hygiene operatory. And if you look at that, you know, what we've done over time, we've added, we've added to the hygiene. We haven't taken anything away. Right. We've added, 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 added. So there is this conundrum. You know what it is? Hygienists are always running late. You ever talk to a hygienist that's there on time? No. Yeah, about 90% of them always running late, always running late, always running late. Now, part of that is you and I, why they're running right. late. That's a whole other uh, subject that we can have a conversation <laughs> about. But right. for the most part, you know, how, how do you do that? First of all, you've got to give them the time. Number two, mm-hmm. guess what? You've got to educate them on the stuff you do. Right. You know, if they never see what you do, you know, I, I'll see a dentist who has sleep apnea to his practice or her practice. Okay. 
They have not. The, the, uh, yes, Hodgins. Well, do you know uh, that what what are they doing with the sleep apnea? I have no no clue. I just know it has something to do with snoring. Mm-hmm. Well, wait a minute. What about that bevy of all those patients you have on recare? Right. You, you, you know, did you ever even ask them if they have a sleep apnea or snoring? No, I didn't know. I was supposed to do. I mean, they're cleaning teeth. Mm-hmm. So the so the second thing they have to do is to what get their knowledge base up. Send them to courses. By the way, you know, I just mentioned that when you say a high quality dental practitioner, they go to a lot of CE courses. Mm-hmm. Guess what? Also, I found high quality dental practitioners send their team to CE oh, courses. Absolutely. You ever notice that? Yeah. They pay. They pay. I'm not talking about the local study club that evening serving pizza. They pay. And you know what? They 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 also uh, go with their team when they go to courses. When right. I see, when I see, sometimes when I'm doing one of these large group things, uh, six hours and there's three, four hundred people in the room, you know what I've seen at the end of the six hours, seven hours? What? I'll look in the back, there'll be a round table of the dentist with her team and they're debriefing right then. The Love others it. are scampering to get out on a Friday afternoon before the traffic hits. You know what they're doing? They're debriefing. They're debriefing. And I will bet. That when you look at the gross income and the amount of hours that are worked, that practice is hitting on all cylinders. Oh, absolutely. And what you're talking about is a fundamental mind shift in how you look at CE to begin with. It is not a cost. It is an investment. And it is an investment in people. The best people out there know you grow the people around you. You made me read that book 20 years ago. Um, good to great. And the essence of what Colin says in the book, you could summarize it almost in one sentence. It's not people. It's finding the right people. And when you find the right people, you make the investment in them, which is their education. Also, too, Sam, you know, I think you would agree with this, too. Um, when you look at your costs, some people say, oh, my gosh, my team compensation cost. No, no, no. That is also a line item. That is an investment. It's an investment that you expect to get a return. So when you buy a CEREC, a laser, anything like that, I think one of the first things you have to do is pay for the training to be able to utilize that. And you're exactly right. My favorite, we do seminars all over the country, sometimes over the world. You can see the teams, they'll debrief right on the side. Right. And they'll say, hey, look, how do we put this in play? Because they know in 48 hours, most of this is going to be gone. Or they have a scheduled team meeting. That's a good thing to do is never take a course without a scheduled team meeting, either on Monday or Tuesday, to discuss the essence of it and put some stuff in play right away so you can get some traction. So you are spot on, my friend. So, and that's why I love you, man. I have so many more things I want to ask you. You know, I want to go into the deep perio conversation about the actual future of perio. I want to talk to you about that. I want to, I want to do a whole nother hour on the fence posts and the dirt because that changed. I also want to talk about implants and how they're not just about the retention of teeth, but also, I mean, it's, it's about retaining the shape of, of a beautiful face. So there's so many things, buddy. And I just, I'm so grateful you would be on and share with us. Now, how can people find you if they want more information about Dr. Sam Lau? Well, um, the, the best way is that we do have a website, which is, uh, drsamlau.com. It's D-R-S-A-M-L-O-W.com www.drsamlau.com. That tells us where our programs are. But uh, I've always believed in information transfer. So if you want to get in touch with me, email me. S-L-O-W. I know it sounds like slow, but Uh it really is my first initial, my last name. S-L-O-W at dental, D-E-N-T-A-L dot U-F-L still my University of Florida affiliation, UFL, dot edu. So it's S-L-O-W at dental dot UFL dot edu. Or if you want information about what we do, um, which also will get there uh, through my other uh, web, my other email would be uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Sam dot com. No, no dot www dot Dr. Sam dot com. OK, awesome, buddy. Thank you so much. Well, I appreciate oh, all welcome. of you guys. Yeah, appreciate you, Sam. Sam, we're going to do a whole bunch more in these and go deep into the um, perio aspects of things. And thank you all for watching. Really appreciate it. Again, please add your comments on the side. Um, It's so funny. Maria Goldie says, hi, Sam. 
Um, and uh, so please add those and I'll have Sam uh, answer some of the questions and get back to you personally. So until we see you next time, please keep watching the Best Practices Show. You guys have a great rest of your day. Thank you great. very much. Thank you, Kerr. Great.